This is Duke University. Global trade and environmental the justice. Human China rights issues are still. The term Ubuntu. A the alien and sedition accident. Is making inferential discovery. The importance of an archive. The John Hope Franklin Center. The tradition of black prophetic thought and social justice of the black church has often meant that the black church has engaged black lives beyond the four walls of the church. This is a tradition that our guests, Reverend Sekou and Professor Obrey Hendricks know very well. Today they join us on Left the Black to talk about their new books, God's Gaze and Guns, Essays on Race, Religion, and the Future Democracy, and the Universe Bends Towards Justice. I'm Mark Anthony Neal and this is Left the Black. Welcome back to Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined this afternoon by Professor Aubrey Hendricks, visiting scholar of the Institute of Research in African American Studies and the Department of Religion at Columbia University. The author of several books, including The Politics of Jesus, Rediscovering the True Revolutionary Nature of Jesus' Teachings and How They Have Been Corrupted, that's Three Leaves Press, and the brand new book, The Universe Bends Towards Justice, Radical Reflections on the Bible, the Church, and the Body Politic, and that's Orbis Books. How are you doing today, Over? Doing well, yeah, brother. Thank you. Uh, so thank you to have you on the show. I, I know you had the opportunity this weekend uh, to go to the homegoing ceremony of, of Whitney Houston. Uh, talk a little bit about your experience there, what you saw. I, I mean, there's been a lot of chatter about the, those four and a half hours that were on the air on Saturday. Uh, but a lot of it really has to do with, you know, mainstream America, white America, really getting a sense of, of, of what this black church tradition is. Um, talk a little bit about your reflections of, of being there at the homegoing ceremony. Yeah, it was uh, an extraordinary experience. Um, what struck me was how dignified it was um, and uh, the breadth of, of, uh, of the, and the depth of the statements that were made about, about Whitney. It gave us a real sense of who she was. Um, and I think it was representative of the best of the African American church tradition, its celebratory nature, its dignity, uh, up until the sermon. Uh, I must tell you, uh, <laughs> you know, it was at, at a funeral. You have eulogies, and Marvin Winans has said all week he wasn't giving a eulogy; he was giving a homily, you know, sort of preach a sermon. Right. Never, never made sense to me. But we had this sermon um, that does not represent the best of who we are. I think because it was, we had three songs performed. We had uh, a sermon performed. Um, Whitney's name was never mentioned in what was supposed to be a eulogistic moment. Yeah. Uh, but we had time to hear about the, uh, uh, the uh, anti, um, the prosperity anti god And so I, I had some, some problems with that. I don't think that represented the best of it. And, and I think that's a really nice kind of jumping up point, uh, jumping off point to, to talk about the book. I mean, you, you opened the book with uh, this really uh, interesting and really provocative discussion about, you know, where contemporary gospel music is, right? And, and by extension, really, where the contemporary black church is. And, 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 and I love the title of the section, um, you know, this quote from Kirk Franklin, I am the holy dope dealer. And, and, and you go in deep to talk about the distinctions about what the spirituals represented for black America and, and, and what gospel represents now. Talk a little bit about how those reflections about gospel music kind of reflect on what you saw on Saturday afternoon um, in, in Newark, New Jersey. Yeah, in, in this essay, I, I um, sort of decry the, uh, the, the, the real turn uh, to, um, to depending on, on, on performance. Yeah. In black sacred music. Right, well, clowning, uh, as, you, as, as you describe it. <laughs> well, no, it, actually, clowning was how the early, some of the early gospel singers uh, described it. Right, right. Yeah, they called it trickeration and clowning. Interestingly, Elijah Muhammad got trickeration from, from gospel singers. Right, but folks like Ira Tur Tucker and. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah and they weren't denigrating it, but what they were acknowledging that what they did was very much based on performance, and I told you that. And um, Kirk Franklin, uh, his statement you know, re represents. Uh, that this this music, in his view, um, and he's representative, I think, that it, that it, it really is about changing how people feel. It's not about uh, inspiring them, empowering them to change the world, to change uh, change conditions. It's to address the symptoms 
of, uh, of, of uh, social pathology and pain and suffering, uh, but not the causes. Um, and so the spirituals, of course, had an eschatology of liberation. We talked about we're going to be free one day. We talked about yeah. the major yeah. motif was the exodus. But in, liber in gospel music, it's like leave it to Jesus and uh, you know, everything will be all right. There's nothing we can do. And um, it's just like Mark said, unfortunately, it's much like the opiate of, of the people. It changes the way they feel, but doesn't really em empower them uh, to, to uh, address conditions. Actually, it doesn't even mention the, uh, the conditions. Yeah. Listen to gospel music, uh, everything it says, and not have, have any sense of how important this moment of late capitalism is uh, for our people. And I mean, you mentioned, in fact, that you know, contemporary gospel music almost has a, an apocalyptic version you know, of the world, right? That, that you know, it, it's already ended, right? So everything is about, <laughs> you know, what happens afterwards. Um, but you, you, you use this great quote from the anthropologist James C. Scott, you know, the idea of what the value of, of black sacred music was, was the ability to make a space for a dissident culture. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how we have transitioned from that moment uh, to the moment that we're in now? Yeah, yeah, well, you know, there's, there's a, a section heading in, I think it's called See No, Hear No, Speak No. Yeah, yeah. Speak No Political Evil, I think that's what it's called. Um, the the gospel, gospel spirituals uh, had a prophetic nature uh, in, in the sense that they spoke about the oppression. They named it, and they empowered people to resist it. Gospel music doesn't name uh, the, the, the our problems doesn't name the oppression, the exploitation. It doesn't in, in, empower or exhort people to resist it at all. It just says, leave it to Jesus, and just you'll be okay in, in the by and by. Now, it'll make you feel better. You know, people come out of church saying, whoa, boy, we still had church. I mean, we still had fun. Um, and it just changes the way you feel, and it can assuage your pain for a minute. But if you do everything gospel music says, you will not expect, uh, you will not change this society to make it more just, nor will you expect it to be more just. You will just turn to Jesus and the church and leave the world to the devil, as, as, as it were. The spiritual, though, had a different thing in mind. Now, you know, the, the, the kind of critique that you just offer is one that we often hear um, about contemporary R&B, contemporary urban music in general, and specifically contemporary hip hop, right? That, that hip hop isn't conscious enough, is, it's not really engaged in the world that we need to navigate. Why do you think the gospel music doesn't get that same kind of critique? Um, you know, and I know part of it is obviously in terms of the vulgarity and some of the excesses of hip hop. Um, but for the most part, most folks don't think about gospel as really functioning that same way that we often criticize hip hop music for. No, you're absolutely right. I think part of it is, as I say in this article, that gospel music, we forget that the spiritual is really is foundational and, and therefore, yeah. I would say, normative black sacred music. Yeah. Um, as we move into the, into the urban environment and with a, a sense of the peak set in, um, gospel music, um, Dorsey said he started to bring good news and make people feel better. Well, folk uh, have focused so much on it's on how it ameliorates uh, the emotional effects, the psychological effects, and at least temporarily, of, of our suffering, that they, they give it a pass. It's like it, it helps us get through the day, it helps yeah. us get through the week, yeah. and so we'll give it a pass. And you're right, there's nothing vulgar in it, and so they've accepted it as, um, they've accepted this music as normative for us, just like so many blacks have accepted, um, accepted the, the body politic as being as, as being inevitable yeah. and uh, unchangeable, I think. Yeah. We're, you're watching Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined this afternoon by Professor Aubrey Hendricks, who is at the Institute of Research in African American Studies in the Department of Religion at Columbia University. And we're talking about his new book, The Universe Bends Towards Justice, Radical Reflections on the Bible, the Church, and the Body Politic. That's published by Orbis Books, 2011. A lot of folks have gotten to know uh, your work, Professor Hendricks, recently uh, on places like MSNBC and CNN. And, and as kind of a counter-narrative to what we're seeing in terms of national politics, uh, on the one hand, we're looking at conservatives, uh, largely Republicans, uh, who are often very offering very interesting critiques of poor people and working class people and working class cities 
that seem to be disconnected from the realities of what you know these cities and these folks are, are, are experiencing. And, and then if we go on the left, we don't nearly see a kind of passion for addressing the, these kind of uh, lessers, you know, economically lessers in our society. Talk a little bit about what you're, what we're witnessing at this moment. Uh, this real disconnect um, between, you know, what might be a politics of Jesus in terms of how he would have thrown his lot in with the 99 percent, um, and, and and what we see as a kind of politics of of the one percent. Well, you know, what I talk about in a couple of chapters in that book on the political economy, mm -hmm. um, supply is, side economics. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I do point to well, first that uh, it's lost that the the biblical vision of of uh, society and of economic society is an egalitarian. Yeah. Uh, the mm -hmm. prophetic voice rules in the eighth century BC they stood up and, and said that uh, the measure of society is not the way we treat our kings, the divine right of kings, but the uh, the way that we grant everyone equal rights, but also the way we look out for the least of these, the poorest and the most vulnerable. Now, what we're seeing in this moment is, uh, is a, a moment in which the truth of the biblical witness is being subsumed by the interests of those in power. And frankly, brother, put in basic terms, they are lying about what, uh, what the, the biblical witness says. Yeah. They have distorted it, distorted it to the point that they, um, you know, we talk, Russell Kirk says in the conservative mind that they must mean part of a, a bedrock a tenet of conservatism is that they must maintain differences in classes. We right, see that right. in Rick Santorum. He says the exact same thing, inequality is good, but he's such a Christian, and no one pushes back because they have conflated, they've con uh, they have uh, 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 replaced the very basic notion of biblical notion of justice with, um, with the notion of interest. Right. And this flies in the face of a biblical witness. The biblical witness talks about how we have responsibility for uh, others in society, not not about freedom from responsibility, which is what conservatism talks about now. Freedom, freedom. They, they don't talk about responsibility. So they have distorted in a very fundamental way uh, the, the biblical witness and the witness of Jesus, who talks about the poor and the impoverished more than anything else in the gospel other than God. You know, you, we talk about Santorum and, and, and of course, Romney, uh, New Gingrich and, and I'll throw Ron Paul into the mix. And, and when you listen to some of their rhetoric, um, and, and you you know you talked about this in relationship to to Romney, and and uh, the history of the of the Mormon Church to to black folks, you know, as you wrote about in the Huffington Post back in January. I mean, when we look at this kind of amped up racial rhetoric that we're hearing from these men, um, and, and some of their followers, I, I mean, are they simply bigots, or is there something else at play um, here? I think that there is there's bigotry there, but more important, I think the, the, the real lapse here is that they do not ask the fundamental question uh, for your Western biblical uh, your Western ethics, which comes out of the prophetic period, and that is what is the just thing. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're talking about what serves just us primarily. What is what is in our interest, uh, and uh, I think that's the, the main question, and that's in in, in that. That lack of concern for interest, of course, I mean, for justice, leaves room for all injustice, yeah. including racial injustice. Though we do know, let's face it, there is a racial component to the rhetoric as, as well. I, I mean, you make a very shrewd observation in talking about, you know, supply, to economic, supply side economics and the impact of Milton Friedman and how this has kind of informed, you know, economic policy over the last 30 years, you know, that, that we're, it's not really founded on economic foundations. But, you know, what we're really seeing is kind of an ideological push for a certain notion of protecting, you know, that 1% as opposed to following sound economic policies. And, and of course, in some ways, we, you know, 2008 is inevitable within that context. You know, if you're sitting here and, and, and you have the president's ear, um, you know, you get to offer him, you know, Aubrey Hendrick's sermon, <laughs> you know, to, to get him to think about how going forward. I mean, what are some of the key points that you would make to the president at this point in time in light of the economic realities that we're in? This this president, Obama. Yes, this president. Yeah, I, well, I tell him some things that he already knows, having you know, been, a, been a, a lover of John Rawls and Galatianism. <laughs> I would remind him um, on on the political level and the political on the level of the faith that he 
about it, that um, what that the measure of a just society is how it treats its its poorest and its most vulnerable. Number one. Number two, that um, we have a responsibility to ask the question, um, some form of the question, what is just in every policy formulation. But if you can't do that, at least keep in mind that the basis of our, our ethical approach must be an egalitarian one, yeah. that everybody has, has, has the same right. If I hear your question correctly. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts about the 99% movement? I think that Occupy movement, Jesse Jackson and I talked about that. Um, it is, again, it's traceable to the prophetic imperative hmm. of looking out for everybody, making making sure that, that everyone has the same, has equal access, not equal outcome, but equal access <laughs> to opportunity and the good things in life. Occupy movement is completely consistent with that. Yeah, you know, they, right. they're, they're raising the contradiction and it's completely consistent with that. Absolutely. We've been joined this afternoon by Professor Aubrey Hendricks, who is a visiting scholar at the Institute of Research for African American Studies and the Department of Religion at Columbia University. He is the author of several books, including The Politics of Jesus, Rediscovering the True Revolutionary Nature of Jesus' Teachings and How They Have Been Corrupted, and the new book, The Universe Bends Towards Justice, Radical Reflections on the Bible, the Church, and the Body Politic. Thanks for taking some time out to join us this afternoon, Aubrey. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome to Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're here at our studios here at the John Hope Franklin Center at Duke University. We are joined this afternoon by Reverend Osaji Fosokseku, author, documentary filmmaker, public intellectual organizer, pastor, and theologian, author of several books, including Urban Souls and the just published book, God's Gaze and Guns, Essays on Race, Religion, and the Future of, of Democracy. How are you doing today, Reverend Sekou? I am do I'm wonderful, dear brother. It's so good to see you. It's been too long. Yes, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. I, I was first introduced to your work uh, shortly after Urban Souls came out. Um, and I remember you were doing kind of a small tour thing with Cornell West. And, and to myself, I was like, you know, who's this cat? You know, did I, did I need to connect with? And, and it's particularly always refreshing when we see this new generation uh, of, of black ministers, uh, of black thinkers from the pulpit, you know, that are really kind of trying to deal with not just our spiritual crisis, but obviously our political and our cultural crisis at the same time. Reverend Sekou is a former senior minister of the Lemuel Haynes Congregational Church. And of his new book, the late Manning Marable said, God gay, God's gaze and guns offers a visionary black liberationist theology for addressing the great challenges facing America and the world in an era of war, racism, and violence. And again, that's the late Manning Marable. Uh, talk a little bit about, um, you know, we'll start with Manning for that reason. Talk a little bit about your relationship with, with Manning Marable and, and, and your thoughts about his, uh, his biography of Malcolm X, which came out in the spring. Well, you know, Manning was a dear elder brother to me. Um, you know, much in terms of kind of, I, I, well, I'm a southerner, right? I'm from a little place called Zent, Arkansas. Got about 11 <laughs> houses. And so I was raised by my grandmother and her friends. And so I have an affinity, affinity for elders. Yeah, uh, yeah. And Manning was one of those elders who took me serious uh, as a young intellectual trying to make some sense of the world who was wrestling with the life of the mind, but on the ground. And so in my first book, Urban Souls, I sent Manning a copy and he gave a loving and glowing blurb. Uh, and then he would invite me regularly to give talks at Columbia, to uh, give talks at uh, the National Association of Black Political Scientists, mm -hmm. uh, and also did a few uh, panels for me, wrote some recommendations. And this is for a guy who's not who, who's not firmly in the academy. I'm uh, right. on the fringes right. of the academy. Right. and But he just invested deeply in me. And much can be said about black intellectual life, but uh, uh, nice goes a long way with me, and loyalty <laughs> goes a long way with me. And, Manning was really good uh, to me. I was actually invited to give a talk in Paris in September, right after his book came out on Islam and the city uh, he had recently passed. And so 
uh, the group there of intellectuals that I spent time with uh, in Paris when I was an expat invited me to come over and give mm -hmm. a talk because of his relation, my relationship with him. He was very good to me. Uh, his text, Malcolm X, has generated some uh, uh, controversy. Yeah. Um, uh, the folks have been critical of it. Uh, Amir Baraka read, wrote a devastating critique of the text uh, in terms of critiquing Manning as an intellectual, critiquing Manning's, uh, Manning's uh, ideology and intent around the book. What's powerful about the text is that he, 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 he links Malcolm to the prophetic tradition of the black church. Part of Malcolm, the, the popular narrative is that Malcolm was a thug, criminal, uh, who was transformed by the nation of Islam. But I actually argued in Paris and argue now that what Manning does is locate him in such a way that we get this sense of Malcolm being connected to the prophetic tradition, given that his father was a Garveyite and a black preacher, mm -hmm. and that his and, and that one can make the argument that Malcolm's return through the nation of Islam is a return to the prophetic tradition, it's a return to his own uh, prophetic consciousness. Because at one level, the nation of Islam, as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad uh, uh, formulated, it is very much gleaning from the prophetic tradition of the black church, given yeah. the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's proximity to the Honorable Marcus Garvey and all the kind of what Arthur Fossett's uh, work in 19... 30s around uh, his uh, small assessment of the black church and what he calls black religious cults is that the Honorable Marcus Garvey's in, I mean, and Honorable Elijah Muhammad is in conversation with a variety of black religious traditions that are emerging in that time and era, particularly uh, in Harlem. And so my own beloved denomination of Church of God in Christ uh, is part of Arthur Fox's, uh, Foss's critique and uh, 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 ethnography of black church cults at the time. And so Malcolm, though, the, uh, uh, Manning locates Malcolm within a prophetic tradition of the black church. And I think it was an ingenious, insightful, and needed intervention within the context of black mm -hmm. religious discourse, yeah, right. black uh, political uh, uh, understanding, and in more in particular, uh, our treatment of Malcolm. And then lastly, you know, Manning found it like, 10 African-American studies departments around the country. And what was unique about his program, I visited his program at Ohio State once, and the same thing was at the program in Columbia, that it was always connected to the community. Yeah, so you always had the yeah. options of doing some form of community service, some form of community activism connected to your intellectual project. And he demanded that his students link mm. their work. The uh, and right. and, and, and right. the last 20 years of his work focused on the prison industrial complex and uh, criminal justice. And so that is the gift and genius. And unfortunately, he's the last, he was the last uh, of a dying of a generation. Uh, we're here with Reverend Sekou and you know, your, your latest book, God's Gaze and Guns, one of the things that comes out throughout the book is this kind of notion of exile, um, seeing yourself as in exile. And, and I wanted to read, you know, this quick quote from Edward Said uh, from his book, Representations of the Intellectual. Saeed said, intellectual in exile does not respond to the logic of the conventional, but to the audacity of the daring, and to represent change to moving on, not mm. standing still. Talk about your own role in this kind of, ex you know, this tradition of being in exile as a thinker, as a theorist, as a social theorist, but particularly as, as, as a pastor and a minister and a theologian. Mm. Well, you know, I, uh, uh, you know, the great Edward Said's work has touched me so much, uh, particularly his autobiography, uh, his memoir out, uh, I think it's out of place, uh, and then representations of the, uh, uh, I travel with three books, representations yeah. of the intellectual, James Baldwin's uh, Fire, The Next Time, and uh, Albert Camus has a collection of essays uh, called The Rebel. And so these, uh, uh, his collection of essays, I think it's Rebel, Rebellion, Resistance, and Death. And, uh, and these essays have had such an impact on me. Uh, much of my own personal narrative, my grandmother got me when she was 55 years old. I was six months old. She saved me from a fate that may have been mm. too terrible to tell. Mm. Uh, and so I was raised by elders, many of them who couldn't write their names. Uh, Miss Roberta couldn't write her name, but everything I know about being an intellectual comes from black people mm -hmm. who were mm -hmm. exiles mm -hmm. in the promised land, mm -hmm. so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so part of my own outsider status that way, my outsider status in terms of not being credentialed in the academy, 
uh, but spending an enormous amount of time lecturing at universities. Um, uh, I was an expat in Paris. I left the United States after the second term, uh, sort of after the, shortly after the second term of George uh, Bush. Uh, and then, um, and my own affinity of, uh, as an existentialist. I am, uh, uh, my own project is to call for a revival of the existentialist project because I believe the struggle that we're in is a lot less about politics but it's more about who controls the discourse. And mm -hmm. so Obama, for instance, governs to the right because it's a right of center discourse. Right. Uh, and then those of us who stand on the left look like we've lost our minds because we're outside uh, the normative discourse. And so the outsider status uh, is one that uh, is both painful and glorious. Uh, it's both a blessing and a burden uh, to kind of stand outside of that uh, outside, stand of that, uh, that process. And so for me as an exile, I am wrestling with the way in which humans make meaning for themselves. Uh, and But it's, 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 it's an existentialist project that is a trialogue between, black liber between liberation theology of Latin America, between uh, the French existentialist tradition and the, uh, uh, and the prophetic tradition of the black church. More immediately, one way I kind of image it is my grand uh, is my grandmother inviting Albert Camus and James Baldwin to her kitchen table and they eat a little sweet potato pie, <laughs> right? And so for me, that, that that trialogue informs my own project. And then as a minister, I am ordained. I am a third generation elder in the Church of God in Christ. My grandfather and great grandfather were elders in the Church of God in Christ. Um, so I am a Pentecostal in that sense. Much of my work can be described as a Pentecostal hermeneutic of suspicion. Uh, I believe in signs and wonders. I believe in a certain kind of mysticism uh, and, and, and metaphysical that I believe when people of African descent choose to organize themselves in a certain way that angels line up on their behalf, that they lean over heaven, the ancient ones lean over heaven balconies rooting us on, and that they, they literally beseech the throne of the great one on our behalf. And so there's a certain mysticism uh, that yeah. comes out of African tradition and African American yeah. rural Southern tradition. And then lastly, uh, as a black preacher, I believe in the black preaching tradition right now, you all are uh, blessed the soil of New North Carolina is blessed with the uh, the, the walking uh, and the words of the great Gardner. Gardner Taylor. Taylor. So yes, I believe yes. in the great <laughs> tradition of black preaching. I believe in signs and wonders. But I affirm gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgendered persons. I support a woman's right to choose, and then I bear a consistent critique of hermene a consistent hermeneutic of suspicion on the biblical narrative. So all of that makes me uh, an outsider. So I'll never. Uh, have a, a mega church, although I have a mega church <laughs> ego. Uh, I won't get invited to certain uh, conferences. Uh, I'll probably never be fully accepted into the uh, yeah, into the, the black intellectual yeah. guild by yeah. virtue of that. But I'm going to be faithful uh, to the day I die uh, by virtue of the uh, 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 I got to be able to sleep at night. Uh, you know, one of the things I, I loved about your description of yourself just then, you know, your, your choice of language. Uh, when you talk about wrestling with traditions as opposed to wrestling with traditions, right? I mean, it does really speak to the way that y you see your work as being fundamentally on the ground. Yes. And, and, and I want to go back, you know, you, you mentioned Obama in passing, and, and you write in your chapter on Barack Obama that his presidency was an electoral and existential victory. And, and I wonder, by those two choices of words, do you also see it as a political victory? Oh yes, yes, yes. Again, my 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 concern is right, right. So so Pentecostals, we place an emphasis on the pneuma, the spirit of it. Yeah. Right, right, right. That the Holy Ghost comes and possesses and quick. I felt some right there. <laughs> <laughs> right. That so 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 the existential and uh, uh, electoral and victory in terms of just winning the election. Existential is uh, in terms of the way in which Black people envision themselves and mm. the, a nation recasting itself. Right. That wonderful line from Donny Hathaway says, "Your image of me is of what I hope to be." Yeah. Right, yeah. uh, right. You, I, you, I treated you unkindly. Can't you see? Right. So Obama is the image of what America hopes to be. A, a, a in part, uh, though not totally true, Horatio Algiers' narrative of coming up from nothing, from a single parent, getting an Ivy League education, become the leader of the free world, quote unquote. 
uh, that is he, he embodies a certain kind of uh, a multiculturalism uh, in terms of his own life, his deployment of certain uh, African-American rhetorical devices and rhetorics building upon the uh, prophetic tradition of the black church, both in his language and his discourse and his embodiment, making connection to the night that he accepted uh, to the preacher from Georgia, if you right. will. So right. all of that is existential. The political for me is a byproduct. Right, because the existential imaging plays a certain point. When I, I was in bed, living in New York when he was elected, got off the train at 11 a.m. and st kids were dancing in the streets. Yeah. Where we won, we won, we won. It was like when uh, Nelson Mandela was freed. It was a powerful image. The next morning on the train uh, from Utica on, on my way into the city on the C, on the, uh, C train, a sister was like, you know, you could feel the energy. The train's crowded and the sister was like, Y'all forgive me, because I'm, I'm, I'm not crazy. I'm ecstatic, because I can tell mm -hmm. my baby now that they can be anything. Mm -hmm. I'm, I, I got yeah. chilled now thinking about it, right? There was a certain powerful. Now, there's some critique. There's some nuances. There's some cleavages in there that need to be paid attention to. But I think the existential was, was important. The problem is, is that the discourse gets flattened out. He becomes an existential idol, and then we can't critique him. Right. right? And, and so we can't bear an analysis on him, right? And so the reality is that in that essay, I am arguing that, and, 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 and in part, it's a defense of Cornell West right. in the midst of the whole uh, fight between him and Melissa Harris Perry, and then the just nasty critiques of him that were on Facebook, Twitter, and online. And so part of it is to say, regardless of Cornell's, uh, 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 who I am indebted to as an intellectual. Mm -hmm. I want to be clear about that, that, that at one level, you know, I, you know, I saw him Sunday, he was speaking to the, uh, two Sundays ago, he was speaking to the uh, Young Democratic Socialists, right? And, I, and, and that and so at one level, he is my intellectual father and that he's been good to me, right, yeah, as an intellectual. Yeah. I watched him walk out of a meeting with Ralph Nader to come meet my youngest son. Tell Nader I'll talk to you later. There's a young brother who just <laughs> stepped on the scene I need to go see, right? And so, so part of it is in the defense of him in terms of his critique saying that we have to hold Obama to the same kind of formulation and critique that every president since Lincoln has been held to. Yeah. Frederick yeah. Douglass and, and, and Lincoln, King and, I mean, uh, 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 FDR and A. Philip Randolph, right. the Johnson and Kennedy administration, right. 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 that every president since Lincoln has been subject to a prophetic critique. And that if we flatten the discourse out to only an insider strategy, right? So, because our thing has been rhetorical, has been protest, rhetorical and organized. It has been an insider strategy and it's been uh, electoral allegiances, right? But if you flatten everything out, because black folk gonna vote, hell, I'm gonna vote for them, right? So black folk, only if you can only use an insider strategy, it flattens the discourse out, and then we can't have a real political critique of right. it. And so my own sense right. of calling is that right. existential critique is to create the space where he can govern to the left. Right. right now, all we have the space is to for him to govern right of center. And if we don't have a prophetic critique as outsiders, bringing it to bear to him, if we flatten the discourse out, right, so we're going to support him in his mean spirit and draconian uh, a speech before APAC and say, no, dear brother, you can't go to war, Iran. You've got to be able to be involved in diplomacy. And you, uh, you may not know, I've been involved with the Fellowship of Reconciliation in some backroom conversations with the ambassador of Iran, as well as with the president of Iran. And we're saying to, we're pushing him to stand down, to allow us to come, to allow a group of civilian dipl diplomats to come view the uh, view the uh, uh, view his nuclear reactors, and so we're saying that we're saying we got to create the space. But if the guy can get up and go, we're going to go to war. We're going to uh, with this crazy piece of legislation that's coming out now in the Senate, forty-four people right. supporting it. And Senate if he doesn't hear any critique, right? If he doesn't hear yeah. a critique, right? He has no other choice. So right. it, we, 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 and so I'm saying our tradition demands Absolutely. that you have to be held accountable. We're here with Reverend Seik, who's the author of the new book, Gods, Gays, and Guns, Essays on Race, Religion, and the Future of Democracy. Uh, you raised this question about, you know, we, we've given up this kind of space on the left to hold the current president accountable, as we have held every president accountable in that regard. And, and part of what you talk about in this book is the invisibility of a religious left. 
you know, to the point that most folk in American society not only think that the left is fundamentally anti-religion, <laughs> But the idea that there is actually a religious left is something that's absolutely foreign to them. Talk a little bit about how the religious left can be much more viable and vital to conversations, you know, of, of, of social justice, of war, of all the conversations of the things that the left really needs to weigh in at this point in time. Well, you know, I, I, I take some of this up in an essay that is not in the book called Beyond uh, Trivial Melodies, uh, uh, building upon George uh, uh, Santiago's uh, uh, text, uh, his quote, where he talks about if basically if intellectuals don't connect themselves to institutions, they're right. a passing fad and they right. produce nothing more than trivial melodies. So I talk, I critique the black churches not being in conversation with Occupy, and I believe that's be in part because we have not paid attention to the black religious socialist tradition mm. uh, with George mm. Washington would be uh, to, uh, to others. Uh, there was a, a Herbert Harrison mm -hmm. Memorial Unitarian Church in Harlem at one point. And so I think that, 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 that that's part of that we've lost track of that tradition. Combined with is the Beltway insider discourse around. Right. I wrote a critique right. of the uh, of this Come Let Us Reason Together document that came out in 2009, all white evangelicals, uh, because the left and the Democratic Party in particular was obsessed, liberals and the Democratic Party was obsessed with evangelical, who've right. always been on the wrong side of history. <laughs> Billy Graham broke Martin Luther King's heart four times. Uh, telling him that he shouldn't be doing civil rights to slow down, right? right? King's response in a letter to Birmingham, letter from a Birmingham jail is a critique and a response to clergy who are telling him. Right, to stand down. Right. Yeah. Slow down. And King right. makes this courageous decision to go to jail on Good Friday, right? right? That's theology, right? And so when you think about that, so there's been a flattening out of that. Then the dominance of prosperity theology uh, which has become normative inside of black religious uh, circles, even the most progressives of us, has flattened the discourse out. We've accepted the Wall Street theology as a norm of theology. I think the way that the prophetic tradition is never going to be a majority tradition. I think that's problem. You know, uh, uh, right now this uh, Bloody Monday, uh, uh, the anniversary of Bloody Monday. Mm -hmm. uh, last year, I was privileged uh, to be given an award by the National Civil Rights Museum, uh, of, uh, uh, of National Voter Rights Museum in Selma. Myself and uh, in one of their prayers were given mm -hmm. uh, Keepers of the Flame Award. Uh, Malika uh, 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 Frontier, uh, Rose Sanders' daughter, helped coordinate that or whatever. And so, and I made a promise to them that I would, I would continue the resurrection of the prophetic tradition and accepting that award from my elders. And I think the way that, and so it's never been a majority tradition. Uh, James Lawson, uh, my dear, we're opening a James Lawson Center to train people in the tradition of uh, nonviolence based on the civil rights tradition. No place in the country where you can be trained in that tradition. Right, right. And James Lawson said only 10%, any city we went to, of clergy showed up. And so I think part of our challenge is to, to keep that alive. And I think the way that we do it is, uh, is three fundamental ways. We must return to the biblical text. Can't organize black folk if you, ain't, if, if you cede all the ground of the biblical narrative. That's interesting. Okay, yeah. You can't. So you yeah. got to return to yeah. the text. Two, uh, you, must, uh, you, must make, you must take the culture of the people seriously. Not Machiavellian. I'm not talking about a Linsky style organizer. I'm talking about you take people seriously, a Gramscian intervention yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. in the American left. And then thirdly, uh, uh, we have to have organized bodies. And for me, this choice that I've made is within the founding of the Freedom Church here in New York City, where we are going to uh, engage in worship, witness, and the word in a way that keeps alive. Because many religious left leaders, we ain't got pulpits, right? And you gotta be accountable to right. people every day. Right. Somebody right. got to marry them and bury them. It makes you more humane. It, 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 there's a certain, uh, there's, there's certain uh, 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 tactility and eros in being with people and struggling alongside them. And so I think that might be one way that I've made a choice uh, to anchor myself in Paris life. I could be wrong. <laughs> an expat back in Paris. You know, my highest aspiration is to be a mediocre poet and an above average novelist. <laughs> you know, it's funny because you mentioned this idea that if you're going to organize black folks now, 
you, you know, you have to recenter the biblical text. And of course, you know, folks would argue, well, what, where does that leave the hip hop generation? But in part, part of the argument you make throughout the book is this idea that for the hip hop generation that really no longer has this connection, black youth in general, no longer has this connection with the black church, they find some of that debate and struggle over good and evil that they would find in biblical texts in hip hop. Yes. <laughs> and so, you know, so to recenter even hip hop in that broader conversation. Well, you know, you know, uh, uh, the, the great worker Monica Miller, who's done a lot around right. this work, yes. uh, she uh, has a new text, I think, coming out uh, on hip hop and religion. She and I lectured together recently, uh, uh, about two years ago, at the uh, uh, We He Believe conference on uh, the African American lectionary. Uh, and so she's doing some of that work. Uh, uh, there's another cat out of uh, Vanderbilt. Uh, Michael Brandon McCormick, who's doing mm -hmm. some interesting stuff on homiletics and uh, uh, black rhetorical devices, right? There's also a Vanderbilt, uh, just graduated, uh, Tamora. Tamora uh, Lomax, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Tamora's doing uh, Lomax and right. Feminist Wire. So there's some stuff happening. There's a sister uh, preacher, Yvonne Gilmore, who is with the uh, Cornell West Theory, but she pastors in uh, Columbus, Ohio. So there's something, uh, Walter Hildago, uh, his new book called Beyond the Four Walls, The Rising mm -hmm. Ministry of uh, mm -hmm. hip hop, uh, and uh, he's a, a, a assistant youth minister at Riverside. So there's some of that stuff happening there. The question I hold hip hop to the same, and you know, I was one of I, my first book, Urban Souls, perhaps was one of the first texts to take up the religious sensibilities of hip hop in 2001. Yeah. Yeah. I was the chairman of the platform committee at the National Political Hip Hop Convention. Uh, and then there's our dear sister, Rosa Clemente, right? right, right. Who's not necessarily religious, but deeply spiritual. Uh, and so there's all of that happening. I think I want to hold hip hop to the prophetic critique, mm. right? So mm. that, that, right. And so in the essay, Spiritual Not Religious, which is reprinted, reprinted from uh, Emmett Price's new text uh, on the black church and hip hop culture. Right. He and I are right. doing a signing together March 25th. Yeah, uh, and right. so yeah we're, we're about to book him on the show. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot coming out in yeah. terms of that. The question is that will we hold it to the same prophetic critique, right? Right, right. Uh, and, 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 and there's some of those forces within, uh, within, within hip hop music. There's uh, M1 and Dead, uh, of Dead Press. Uh, there's the Cornell West theory, uh, that bananas track, uh, Second Rome. Uh, and so some of that, that's Cornell's work with uh, uh, hip hop, is Dyson's work with hip hop. And so some of that is at work. I am not necessarily interested in the formulation of a hip hop the theology. Right, right gotcha, uh, gotcha. Although you did in New Black Man call me a hip hop theologian. I was mad <laughs> with you for about two minutes. <laughs> Uh, 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 but there is some of it. I, I believe hip hop actually is a systematic theology of existence that that it that, that is centering a discourse about how people make meaning for yeah. themselves in the urban context. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Uh, um, and so uh, so in that essay, I'm in conversation with uh, Zizak and his uh, in, uh, poly, uh, in uh, the Parallax View, as well as uh, in uh, in, con tech, in con, uh, conversations with a uh, dear brother's work on uh, vernacularity, uh, 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 the way in which people deploy black vernacular of justice and that kind of thing. But I want to know, like, 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 where, where I ask this of all struggles, where are the least of these in your project? Yeah. Right. And how do you prioritize them? And I want to stay on this least of these theme for a second. You know, when, when folks see the, the title of your book, and we're talking with Re Reverend Sekou about his brand new book, God's Gaze and Guns, Essays on Race, Religion, and the Future of Democracy. And I imagine most Americans, including black Americans, would be able to wrap their heads around the God's piece. They can wrap their heads around the guns piece, but they don't quite know what to do with the gaze piece. And, and you do some extraordinary work here in talking about you know, the idea of gaze as the new black, right? You know, and this is something that was kind of bandied about, you know, during the 2008 election series. SNL, you know, even made jokes about it. And, and you go back to Baird Rustin's own words, right? A speech that he gives in 1986 where he goes, the new niggers are gays. Talk about the importance of centering this conversation around homophobia, you know, not only to the black prophetic tradition, but also to all kinds of concerns around social justice, you know, in this country at this point in time. Well, you know, I, I actually formulate that gays are the new niggas. I, I, I sidestep the gays are the new black. Uh, and uh, it was interesting. Uh, nobody would publish it but Killing the Buddha. Mm. 
Uh, yeah. So I want to send a shout out to uh, uh, Jeff Charlotte, uh, great religious writer, uh, uh, and Nathan, who's the senior editor at King, uh, Killing the Buddha. Uh, and so, and people, they wouldn't publish it because hmm. God said nigger. Right. So, but the, in, the reason why I'm sidestepping the conversation, right, is that again, as an existentialist, I am looking at the ways in which hegemony hmm. Uh, hmm. has its existential, because uh, uh, it is it, defining meaning making, right? You know, the, it, and, and this is part of a rich tradition. Uh, 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 Carter G. Woodson uh, says that uh, you don't have to make a back door for a Negro. He go find it. <laughs> right. That's an existential question. Yeah, right. That's yeah. about he's going to make meaning of his niggardom, his niggerishness, if you will, uh, within the framework. <laughs> and so I sidestep it because, no, black people struggle and gay people is not the same. Right. 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 But be, even before I get to the philosophical argument, I come out of the black church. I have no memory in my life of not having gay black men. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I just can't think of a time mm -hmm. when I didn't have a choir director, right? One can even argue that black choir directing is a queer aesthetic. Yeah. The snapping yeah. of the fingers, the long flowing robes, right? Yeah. That, that I could, one could even argue that, right? That I just don't remember when there was not, not a gay boy on the organ leading us to the highest levels of spirituality. Yeah. Right. right. In my first right. book, I have an essay called Who's Going to Direct the Choir? Right. 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 So, right. so I don't have any memory of that. So this idea that queer folks are somehow outside of the black, black community. Church. Right, 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 just, right. And my grandmama say plum foolishness, right? It's not, it's all right to be a fool, but you can't be a plum fool. And so it's just, it's, it, 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 it's plum foolishness, right? So I think that's problematic. Two, Bayard Rustin, right? The, right a openly right, gay black right. man whose work was so powerful with the, the March on Washington in and 63 ends 15 minutes ahead of schedule. Good. Only a gay black man can make, make that many black preachers be on time, right? And so Ann was the chief fundraiser for SCLC, wrote its constitution. Right. Uh, 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 and so here's right. an openly gay black man. Our hand, his handprints are all over our struggle, right? I mean, yeah, that's, and, con and right. convinced King that nonviolence was just not a strategy. It was a way Your of life. life. Right. And so, and he writes that the new niggas are gays, right? And so I'm taking up his struggle. Because, you know, people be acting like, well, black folks ain't in the, gay black folks ain't in the struggle. Here we are, Bayard Rustin, right. the embodiment of black gay social justice. Right. So you can't get around him. And then when you look at, uh, uh, is that I am arguing existentially that gays are the new niggas because uh, the, 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 the hegemony really got only got about five twos. It don't have a lot in its wheelhouse, right? <laughs> right. It, 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 it's not that imaginative. That's why it always goes after wherever it is in the world. It goes after the artists, the intellectuals, and the musicians first. Right. The creative, right? creative they, people. Right. The creative yeah, class. It ain't, right. got, it ain't got a lot. It ain't got a lot in its wheelhouse. And so naming niggas, faggots, uh, 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 vigilante violence. Emmett Till, Matthew Shepard, right. legislative assaults, Prop right. 8, black codes, and uh, Jim Crow laws, right? Hypersexualized stereotypes, right. Right. employment and, uh, uh, and housing discrimination. So those are similar, a kind of simultaneity is the, is the philosophical term that I've, I've kind of combed to wrestle with this. So this kind of simultaneous situatedness, uh, barring on Guy Deberg and the situationist, mm -hmm. right? Right, right, the simultaneous situation. And so they ain't the same, but they similar. So it invites them into the community of niggas. And so what black folks have to teach gay folks in terms of the prophetic tradition is legislative defeats, but existential victories. Yeah, yeah. It is to look at your yeah. situation and say, you a slave and you say, over my head, I hear freedom in the air, right? That, that, that we make a way out of no, no way, way yeah. right? So it's a way that we can invite them to the community of niggas, but that means particularly white, gay, male, privileged, elite have to come and sit at my grandmama's feet. <laughs> and, that, and, and, and that demands a cutting against a certain form of racial logic and encountering white privilege. And so for me, I'm wrestling with that. And then it's the whole appropriation thing that black people, well, they're appropriating our struggle. Well, the stuff we got, they appropriate. <laughs> we appropriated Christianity, slaves, be obedient to your masters. We said, mm-mm, we ain't doing that. Right, right. My grandmama said women be, her women see be, be silent to the church. Mm-mm. So gay folks had the same right, the Constitution. 
right? The formulation that I argue in terms of the religious precedent of democratic expansion, black people read the Bible in one hand and the constitution or the other. And so gay folk got the same right because the biblical text is a contested text. That's why we got denominations. Right. It's a contested text. There's right. no universal assumptions around the biblical narrative. And so I think all of that plays itself out if we're gonna have a real conversation about black people taking up the, the, the question of queer folks and struggle in a real way. We've been joined this afternoon by our good friend, Reverend Sekou. His new book, God's Gays and Guns, Essays on Race, Religion, and the Future of Democracy, also the author of Urban Souls, a book that I also encourage you to go out and take a read of. Former senior minister at Lemuel Haynes, at the Lemuel Haynes Congregational Church. Thanks for joining us today, Reverend Sekou. Thank you so much, dear brother. And I just want to say thank you for the insightful piece that you wrote on Whitney Houston. I just, oh, thank you very just much. I just really, really appreciate the way you located her and that you got away from the trivialities of the discourse and that you located her within a rich tradition of, uh, one can even argue, of black prophetic music. So thank you, dear brother. Thank I appreciate you. that, man. Take care of yourself. All right. Blessings. Peace. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu. Scott, you know, the idea of what the value of, of black sacred music was, was the ability to make a space for a dissident culture. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how we have transitioned from that moment uh, to the moment that we're in now? Yeah, yeah, well, you know, there's, there's a, a section heading in. I think it's called See No, Hear No, Speak No. Yeah, yeah. Speak No Political Evil, I think that's what it's called. Um, the the gospel, gospel spirituals uh, had a prophetic nature uh, in, in the sense that they spoke about the oppression. They named it, and they empowered people to resist it. Gospel music doesn't name uh, the, 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 our problems, doesn't name the oppression, the exploitation. It doesn't in, in empower or exhort people to resist it at all. It just says, leave it to Jesus, and just you'll be okay in, in the by and by. Now, it'll make you feel better. You know, people come out of church saying, whoa, boy, we still had church. <laughs> and it means you know, we still had fun. Um, and it just changes the way you feel, and it can assuage your pain for a minute. But if you do everything gospel music says, you will not expect, uh, you will not change this society to make it more just, nor will you expect it to be more just. You will just turn to Jesus in the church and leave the world to the devil, as, as, as it were. The spiritual, though, had a different thing in mind. Now, you know, the, the, the kind of critique that you just offer is... That what they did was very much based on performance, and I told you that. And um, Kirk Franklin, uh, his statement, you know, re represents uh, that this, this music, in his view, um, and he's representative, I think, that, that it, it really is about changing how people feel. It's not about uh, inspiring them, empowering them to change the world, to change, uh, change conditions. It's to address the symptoms of, uh, of, of uh, social pathology and pain and suffering, uh, but not the causes. Um, and so the spirituals, of course, had an eschatology of liberation. We talked about we're going to be free one day. We talked about yeah. the major yeah. motif was the exodus. But remember, in gospel music, it's like, leave it to Jesus, and, uh, and then everything will be all right. There's nothing we can do. And um, it's just like Mark said, unfortunately, it's much like the opiate of, of the people. It changes the way they feel, but doesn't really em empower them uh, to, to uh, address conditions. Actually, it doesn't even mention the, uh, the conditions. Yeah. Okay. Listen to gospel music, uh, everything is said, and not have, have any sense of how important it is. And I mean, you mentioned, in fact, that you know, contemporary gospel music almost has a, an apocalyptic version. 
you know, of the world, right? That, that you know, it, it's already ended, right? So everything is about, <laughs> you know, what happens afterwards. Um, but you, you, you use this great quote from the anthropologist James Heath today over. Doing well, here, brother. Uh, so thank you to have you on the show. I, I know you had the opportunity this weekend uh, to go to the homegoing ceremony of, of Whitney Houston. Uh, talk a little bit about your experience there, what you saw. I, I mean, there's been a lot of chatter about the, those four and a half hours that were on the air on Saturday. Uh, but a lot of it really has to do with, you know, mainstream America, white America, really getting a sense of, of, of what this black church tradition is. Um, talk a little bit about your reflections of, of being there at the homegoing ceremony. Yeah, it was uh, an extraordinary experience. Um, what struck me was how dignified it was, um, and uh, the breadth of, of, uh, of the, and the depth of the statements that were made about about Whitney it gave us a real sense of who she was. Um, and I think it was representative of the best of the African American church tradition, its celebratory nature, its dignity. Uh, up until the sermon, uh, I must tell you, uh, <laughs> you know, it was at, at a funeral. You have eulogies, and Marvin Winans has said all week he wasn't giving a eulogy; he was giving a homily, you know, to preach a sermon. Right. Which never, never made sense to me. But we had this sermon um, that does not represent the best of who we are. I think because it was, we had three songs performed, we had uh, a sermon performed. Um, Whitney's name was never mentioned in what was supposed to be a eulogistic moment, yeah. uh, but we had time to hear about the uh, uh, the uh, anti um, the prosperity anti god, and so I, I had some some problems with that. I don't think that represented the best. Of and, and I think that's a really nice kind of jumping up point, uh, jumping off point to, to talk about the book. I mean, you, you opened the book with. Uh, this really uh, interesting and really provocative discussion about, you know, where contemporary gospel music is, right? And, and by extension, really, where the contemporary black church is. And, 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 and I love the title of the section, um, you know, this quote from Kirk Franklin, I am the holy dope dealer. And, and, and you go in deep to talk about the distinctions about what the spirituals represented for black America and, and, and what gospel represents now. Talk a little bit about how those reflections about gospel music kind of reflect on what you saw on Saturday afternoon um, in, in Newark, New Jersey. Yeah, in, in this essay, I, I um, sort of decry the, uh, the, the, the real turn uh, to, um, to depending on, on, on performance. Yeah. And black sacred music. Right, well, clowning, uh, as, you, as, as you describe it. <laughs> well, no, it, actually, clowning was how the early, some of the early gospel singers uh, described it. Right, right. Yeah, they called it trickeration and clowning. Interesting, me, Elijah Muhammad got trickeration from, from gospel singers. Right, but folks like Ira Tur Tucker and. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah and they weren't denigrating it, but what they were acknowledging. This is Duke University. Global trade and environmental justice. Human rights issues are still. The term Ubuntu. A alien and sedition accident. Is making inferential discovery. The importance of an archive. The John Hope Franklin Center. The tradition of black prophetic thought and social justice of the black church has often meant that the black church has engaged black lives beyond the four walls of the church. This is a tradition that our guest, Reverend Sekou, and Professor Obrey Hendricks know very well. Today, they join us on Left the Black to talk about their new books, God's Gaze and Guns, Essays on Race, Religion, and the Future Democracy, and The Universe Bends Towards Justice. I'm Mark Anthony Neal, and this is Left the Black. Welcome back to Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined this afternoon by Professor Aubrey Hendricks, visiting scholar of the Institute of Research in African American Studies and the Department of Religion at Columbia University. The author of several books, including The Politics of Jesus, Rediscovering the True Revolutionary Nature of Jesus' Teachings and How They Have Been Corrupted, that's Three Leaves Press, and the brand new book, The Universe Bends Towards Justice, Radical Reflections on the Bible, the Church, and the Body Politic, and that's Orbis Books. How are you doing, 